All right, you're on. Welcome civil rights and social justice section leadership. This webinar will hopefully give you everything you need to know about enacting ABA policy, the CRSJ way, choosing an issue, drafting a resolution and report, receiving approval from the section council, organizing support from other entities, choosing speakers, and preparing for the House of Delegates session. If there's anything we're missing, we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. You can ask questions by finding the questions drop down box on the right hand side panel and typing in your question. You don't have to wait till the end to ask them, though we may wait till the end to answer them. We will be sharing a recording of this program with everyone who has registered so that you can share it widely with your colleagues. Please feel free to leave us feedback and ask questions to follow up. So now we'll get started. I'm Estelle Rogers. I'm one of the section delegates from the section of civil rights and social justice to the House of Delegates. And I've been that for a good long time. Uh, so everything I know, I hope you will now know. I, I wanna tell you that what we're doing here is something like how a bill becomes a law, only we're also doing how, become, how a bill becomes a bill. In other words, the resolution and report process, how to put things together, how to make them work, and how to win. Why do we do this in the first place? Uh, the ABA needs an official policy in order for the leadership to speak, in order for the organization to lobby via its governmental affairs office, and in order for the organization to file amicus briefs in the Supreme Court and sometimes other courts, but usually in the Supreme Court. So how the ABA operates in the uh, lobbying shop is that there are legislative priorities that the ABA adopts through a, a somewhat democratic process. And the legislative process uh, pro priorities are usually 10 in number. And they're fairly broad and generic, like international rule of law, uh, support for the Legal Services Corporation, civil rights, and like that. So a lot of things fit under them. The legislative priorities are the priorities on which the Governmental Affairs Office lobbies. So that if you pass a resolution on something that doesn't fit well into those priorities, they probably won't lobby on them. And that's a frustration, but it's true. However, in the amicus process, which is also a reason for passing a resolution and thus adopting formal ABA policy, there is no such priority uh, structure. So an amicus brief can theoretically be filed on anything, any case on which uh, a policy has been passed. The one catch with the amicus process in the ABA is the uh, amicus committee and the leadership has to actually see a brief before they decide whether to adopt it. It's a big frustration. You can literally have a firm right of fabulous brief and have the ABA not file it, but that doesn't happen all that often. Some of the results of our labors will be evident to you and sometimes even evident to the wider world and some will not. Uh, there are plenty of lobbying positions the ABA takes and, in, um, and nobody really knows about them. Uh, they write very public letters to House and Senate members, then people know about them. They're in meetings a lot, and sometimes with other organizations, sometimes alone, and you may never know about it. Uh, with the amicus briefs, of course, that is a public document, and anybody who wants to know about it can. Um, the ABA only files amicus briefs by itself. It does not uh, file a, a group brief ever. That's also a frustration, because the ABA wants a brief that speaks uh, completely to what the ABA's interest in the subject is or what expertise the legal organization would have that other amici wouldn't. So it's got a sort of narrow purpose. Um, a great example of a policy that had a big and very public impact uh, was the death penalty moratorium, uh, which was passed in the late 90s. And it has been used by the ABA in a variety of forums. One is uh, state legislative bodies, state administrative bodies, uh, several amicus briefs, and I think probably on the federal level too. But the 
fact is that it got a lot of press and a lot of play. So it is possible when you go to all the trouble of doing this, that the, Im the impact will be felt around the country. And this one really was. Other policies have had much less play. And some of that is for political reasons. Um, one I can easily think of is the uh, pro-choice on abortion policy that was passed in the early 90s and I think has literally never been used by the ABA. That's a long sorted history and it's not important, but the fact is that I think we're trying to change that now. Um, I think that that's probably the best overview I can give of what you're going to hear about and uh, the more detailed presentation about how these things are done and what they look like will be presented by my colleague, Mark Schickman, who is my co-delegate to the House of Delegates from our section. Mark. Thank you, Estelle. And um, it's, it's, it's always a wise thing to, uh, to follow Estelle, follow Estelle's lead. I've been doing that for a very long time, so I'm glad to do it in this webinar <laughs> as well. And I also um, want to thank um, the uh, uh, 20 or so of you who are on the call right now to learn a little bit more about the resolution process and, um, and uh, really the nuts and bolts of how to handle um, a resolution. So uh, let's go to the first slide and let me um, identify on the next slide, if I could, the most important person who, um, uh, is is coordinating this along with um, with uh, her right hand person Ali Paula Shapiro, our our section director, is somebody who, uh, as you think about a resolution, she is a great resource. Uh, she understands what policies are important to the section, what policies we have, will help to work on the calendar of knowing what's on what's on our plate. Um, resolutions are really important, but um, we can't have 50 of them going at the same time. So um, Paul is able to coordinate with that. Um, you know, I just can't tell you the number of ways uh, uh, that that she assists in terms of this process. So you know, just understand um, the importance of her as kind of the first resource. And her contact data is at the bottom of this slide. So let's move to the uh, to the next slide. Uh, and by the way, as we are doing this, um, you know, we ran through a little bit that there is that question box that that we have over there. Please feel free uh, feel free to use it. We really want to make sure that we answer your questions. And the only way that we can make sure that we do that is that if, if there's something you want to raise and we're not hitting it, please pop it in that question box so that we can deal with it. All right. Um, the council has got um, our, the the section council has got five special council, and each of the special council uh, is in charge of of some committees. Our committees are divided among the five of them, so um, they are an important link again to coordinate with because you know they can tell you what's on our agenda, what's not on our agenda whether uh, we're in the middle of talking about an issue um, already, um, and really a large part of the job, uh, of their job, is coordinating with the committee. So as a committee chair thinking about policy, um, please do that. And this is gonna be the first of several commercials for um, an email which um, our fearless leader, Wendy Mariner and Paula put together with, um, with really a toolbox for what you as committee chairs need, including a, uh, a link to the responsibilities of um, your special counsel. So that's at the bottom of this slide as well. When we talk about special counsel, the next slide goes into more detail. Uh, and it identifies the five special counsel um, who, who we have one of these people is your contact? Each of these people are great contacts. So um, uh, if you if you haven't plugged in with them yet, please do so. Um, now that I've identified this, the the council, the next thing for you to know is um, that Estelle and I are your delegates uh, to the House of Delegates. So uh, just know in general, 
Um, the House of Delegates has give or take uh, 500 uh, people. There are, you know, the board of members of the Board of Governors are are in the House. Past presidents are in the House. Um, each each state um, has got delegates in the House. Um, most of the American territories are represented in the House. Our sections are represented in the House, and there are um, other affiliated entities uh, who who uh, work there as well. And um, so, uh, and they are uh, the House is the highest policy making level within the ABA. So, if there's something you want done, um, the Board of Governors largely cannot do this. So, so we aim towards bringing things over to the the House of Delegates. That's what it's all about. As we work towards resolutions, um, Estelle's email and my email are down there. Um, we are resources for you. We work for you. So uh, make sure that you um, contact us as well. When resolutions come up, either Estelle, pointing to the, to the box that I'm looking at to the left of mine on, on the screen. Both Estelle and I um, divide up the resolutions that we have. But um, so um, each of us are majoring in one of your resolutions, but we're minoring in, in all of them. So I backstop Estelle, Estelle backstops me. Um, as you get a resolution, one of us will be assigned to it um, as a, as a uh, you know, main uh, uh, resource and the person really carrying it. But if you can't get in touch with one of us, um, get to the other of us and, you know, we will coordinate um, with each other. We try very hard to speak with just, you know, one voice on a resolution. Um, but as I say, uh, feel free to contact either of us uh, if there's any issue that you have with regard to any resolution. So let's get into the meat of the resolutions now. Um, all right. So, so um, you have an idea. Um, you have an idea that that the um, immigration system is broken, and so uh, you want to do something. You see in the news some horrible with that, with regard to the immigration system. You want to do something about it. There's a threat to free speech. You want to do something about it. Um, you're reading about um, a problem with our criminal justice system. You want to do something about it. So. Before you start writing, um, the ABA policy is in something called a green book. And a little bit later in, in this presentation, we will have um, a link to that, which is also in the, uh, in the Mariner uh, Memorandum. Uh, rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? The Mariner Memorandum. That we'll refer to um, a, a, again. So find out, once you have this idea, find out whether it's already ABA policy. Um, and so you look at the green book. Um, and that's where you decide, do you need new policy or do you need action on an existing policy? If it's in the green book already, then maybe what's going to happen is you're going to want um, something taken to the amicus committee and let's get an amicus brief on it. Maybe you want the president of the ABA to put a letter out. Maybe you think we ought to do some programming. Uh, maybe you think that, that, uh, that we ought to run a program for our affiliates that deal with it. So maybe it's just an action item. So that's the first thing you want to check. If not, and you need policy, first thing you want to do is kind of develop what is that, what is that policy going to be? Um, to just say, you know, we we have to have, um, uh, you know, our immigration system is broken. Let's do something about our immigration system. Eh, a little, not quite tight enough yet. So develop what your idea is. Secondly, go to your, take it to your committee. You're not operating as an individual. Take it to your committee to, to, to um, get support for it. Here's a current, here's a current example. Um, the OFCCP, the Office of Federal Contract Compliance, has just come up with new regs that um, make it much, much easier to, to discriminate on the basis of religion, sexual orientation, gender. It's an issue that we sent to our Religious Freedom Committee. Um, and so people are there are looking at it and they're operating on it um, within their um, committee to deal with it. They then bring it to their special counsel and say, okay, what should we be doing about it? And the special counsel says, huh, there are other committees too. 
So let's have our SOGI committee plug in on this as well. Let's have um, our, um, our, our, our gender committee look at it as well. And we'll try to coordinate on that as well. So then once, once you develop that, it's still not ready to take outside of our section, right? Because um, something that's happened on other occasions is that a committee has had an idea, deals with criminal justice, for example, a committee member goes out to the criminal justice section and starts to talk about it. And all of a sudden, word is going around the ABA that our section is coming up with policy on a criminal issue when our council hasn't seen it yet. So we have to avoid that happening. So before anything else happens, once on our internal committee structure, you've taken an idea, it's got to come up to our council for approval. And approval is going to come one of two ways. Maybe you will come in with an idea which is which is you know complete as you as you have got it and the council is able to approve it and say let's calendar it and let's go with it maybe it's it's a much less defined idea and what the council will do is we'll approve it in principle and we'll say go back to work on it and bring it to the next council meeting um then it's going to be approved by the council once it's approved by the council it will be assigned to either me or Estelle to work with. And at that point, you'll start working with one of us to start to coordinate it outside of civil rights and social justice. Very important that that be done, but again, important that it be staged right. So again, if there's amendments that are going on, maybe we want to work on the amendments in-house before we take it out to the larger ABA and you know have issues where our resolution, all of a sudden, we're, we're not in control of our resolution. There's some things that we want to do about this. All right. All right. So that's like the bird's eye view of how this happens. Um, and that's when the process is going to begin. We're going to have um, a, a formal resolution, and we'll go through some steps that we'll be talking about now. Next slide, please. All right. So as you are Mark, thinking- Mark, can, can I jump in for a minute? Yeah, please. I'm, I'll, I'll pause from time to time and look straight at you. So please, anytime. Oh, OK. That's funny looking straight at me because I'm not in front of you. Um, I, I wanted to mention one thing about timing. As you may or may not know, the House of Delegates meets twice a year uh, in February and in August. And resolution deadlines are generally like two months before, like in November in the fall and March. No, it's not March. May. May, 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 before, May. before the August meeting. So uh, you have to keep that in mind too. And I think that um, if you have, for example, a case that you know is pending in the Supreme Court, and one of the reasons you are germinating this idea is to get a brief filed. You have to think about it as quickly as you can, because very often those deadlines are tight, and it's not like you can tell the Supreme Court you've got a little delay because the ABA hasn't met yet. That's it. Great, thank you, Estelle. And and uh, we'll we'll dig a little deeper on that timing, but it's a really important point. All right. So before you get started, um, here are some resources that you should know about. One, the um, the House and its drafting committee has created a drafting guide and a style manual for resolutions and reports. Take a look at that and, and um, it will identify what a resolution and report needs to look at. We're going to have examples of resolutions um, later on in, uh, in, uh, during the course of this program. Um, we don't have any reports on, on a slide over here, but um, one thing I'm going to ask, I think, in terms of uh, the attendees over here, that um, that Paula and Allie might send after we're done, the full resolution and report of the three examples that we're going to deal with um, a little bit later in in this slide deck, so you see what what a resol what a report actually looks like. But it's described in that drafting guide. First thing on your slide. Secondly, as we as we mentioned, check the green book. 
uh, to make sure that you're not duplicating policy that's already there. But sometimes it's very important that you fill in on policy that we have. And then you think about the resolution language itself. There's going to be a specific format for it that we're going to go through. But one of the big differences between our resolutions and resolutions that you've seen maybe in a lot of organizations is that we don't we we don't use whereas clauses in our resolutions. Um, we don't argue reasons in our resolutions. The Rules and Calendar Committee will knock that out. Our resolutions are action oriented, and the reasons for it, what would usually be in a whereas clause, is going to be in the report itself. So those are some initial tips as we move to the next slide. All right, so um, what we have over here are three, are examples of three resolutions that we got passed um, during the last House of Delegates section, uh, session. And it, it highlights work of our, of our committees, um, and it also highlights some of the ways that it goes. So this year we were given the 115 series, and we had a 115 A through F as resolutions that we through H like, through H H wow that we yeah, thank you primarily drafted. By the way, in addition to our resolutions that we primarily draft. Um, we very often are the moving force in the House behind other people's resolution as well. Uh, you know, you may have uh, the Commission on Homelessness and Poverty that, um, that does not have delegates to the House. And so their resolution will have a different number, but very often it's our section which is driving those resolutions as well. But, but we have our own in our own name as well. So this is an example of something that our privacy committee was concerned about, was concerned that the um, Trump administration was going after journalists and in its, its fervor to stop leaks, um, was issuing broad subpoenas to news organizations, et cetera. So this is an idea that they came up with. And it's a very short, sweet resolution, which incorporates uh, 28 CFR 50.10, which, which has regulatory limits on what uh, the government is allowed to do in terms of subpoenas against uh, news um, entities. And boom, it's a nice short resolution. Um, we, we sent it out to various other entities. No amendments were raised to it. Um, and it passed exactly as it was proposed by our committee. So that's the way these resolutions some, go sometimes. Next slide, please. Um, so what we have here is um, one of Estelle's resolutions. And Estelle, let me ask you, as we talk about this one, I see a bunch of red lines um, in this. Um, is this something that, that was passed exactly the way our, our committee pushed it? Or was there a floor fight about it? It was a very interesting and unusual example. We circulated this resolution as we do with all resolutions to a lot of other entities in the ABA um, that we think might have an interest in it. And the health law section, which had we knew would have an interest in it, um, would uh, ask if we could broaden it and that they would support it and love to co-sponsor it. and work to get co other co-sponsors and on and on if we would broaden it. It originally started out as a resolution aimed at least partially at a case that's probably going to be getting cert in the Supreme Court very soon, having to do with reproductive health clinics and the imposition of uh, irrelevant regulations on those clinics. Uh, and they said, you know, there are all kinds of irrelevant regulations and interference in health facilities generally. Why restrict it to reproductive health clinics? And we thought, that's a great idea. Let's broaden it. So they suggested this language, um, and we incorporated it. Now, interestingly, and, and Mark's going to bring this up later, the report then 
did, did not match the resolution. Uh, the report was only about reproductive health clinics and went into a lot of detail about the case that's coming to the Supreme Court and other cases that have been decided on that issue. And now that this passed, which it did, we were very happy with that, uh, the report has to be amended. It can only be amended after the thing passes. So you might have the situation where the report and the resolution go before the House and they don't match. So that needs some explaining before the House, but we'll get to that later down the road. Great, thank you. So this is an example of, of when we shop it out to a different section that has an interest, in this instance, the health law section, it has an idea, we work it out before we get there, it, and and we present this amended resolution to the House. So that is often um, what happens. That it doesn't it doesn't go exactly the way we draft it, but um, we we accept an amendment and it comes on an amended basis. No floor fight. Everything worked out before you get to the House. And let me give you a third example over here. Next slide, please. All right. Now, um, and, and by the way, we're not giving you an example of something which uh, becomes a knockdown, drag out floor fight. Um, for better or worse, that doesn't happen much at the house. Um, most people, uh, most people, if if it looks like a floor fight, they do something to withdraw it or whatever. Um, Sometimes it's really important to have that floor fight, but as I say, typically it's all worked out. So this is a third example. Um, and this is an example um, that that took a, a fairly detailed state equal pay uh, law, and it urges these principles to be um, promoted and adopted by the ABA nationwide. A couple of really important things. Um, we could have just said, resolved that the ABA favors the provisions of California's um, government code 12940I, period, which would have all of these items in it. Um, a problem with that is that our government affairs office, if it's tied to a specific piece of legislation and something that comes out that doesn't match that legislation on all fours might sit there and say, you don't have policy to support because your support was for a specific bill and this bill is different from that bill. You have no ABA policy. So it's usually a good idea not to tie yourself to a specific rule. Usually there are exceptions and you saw that in the first resolution that we gave you. So what this did is it took seven separate concepts and it said House of Delegates adopt these seven concepts. Um, and you know it's always a tactical question. Are we opening ourselves up for a million amendments? Is this going to lead to an hour-long debate? In the committee and in the council, we will work all of that out, but this is just another way to do it, to come in with broad concepts. So what happened? Um, this tracked legislation, which um, dealt with equal pay on the basis of gender and ethnicity. So um, the Disability Rights Committee within the ABA um, came in and said, why don't you add disability rights? which also should be the subject of equal pay, which on balance, um, we as a section did not have a problem with and thought and think is fine. And if you look at disability law nationally, it really does not create major problems, but there were some of our um, coalition partners who were concerned that adding this um, could make us lose more support than we gain. And it's a typical kind of legislative issue. So we're not in a position to really adopt it. But what did we do? We went and we introduced that. In our introduction, we said, there's an amendment coming. And we as a section don't oppose the amendment. 
Um, and um, disability rights had the opportunity to give a three minute speech about it, highlight the importance of these issues in the, in the realm of disability as well. The amendment was passed, the resolution was passed. So this is a third way that it could go. By the way, a fourth way is um, oftentimes people say, um, I want to make a friendly amendment. And you know, just as a parliamentary procedure nerd, um, I always balk when somebody says, I am making a friendly amendment, because uh, you don't know that it's friendly until the author of the resolution says that it's friendly. Um, you know, you make an amendment that you hope is friendly, but it may or may not be. And oftentimes, we will accept an amendment made as a friendly amendment, and um, we'll just take it because, um, you know, we think that it's minor, it's grammatical, what, whatever, and it becomes part of the main resolution. It could run that way as well. The point is that after it gets introduced, there are lots of permutations that this can get amended before it finally gets to a vote. This is an example of one of those resolutions, which has significant detail in it. And, you know, this is right on the verge of having too much detail in it, but it can happen this way. So these are three ways resolutions could happen. Let's move to the next slide. Let me, let me interrupt for a second here. That uh, Mark just raised a point that um, is, is very important to think about in all of these cases, and that is the issue of detail. Uh, I think that the, the, the goal should be that we put in as much detail as we can in order to, as we need to, in order to get the governmental affairs office to lobby on the thing. If it's too vague, they'll say, you know, this doesn't mean anything. How, you know, how does it relate to this bill that we're talking about? And and that and that's a lot of detail, but just enough because if you had a a, a law a bill that was slightly different, you want to be able to lobby on that too. So there's a you know careful balance there. You don't want it too generic, but you also don't want to cut yourself off by having too much detail that will implies that all of those things are necessary in order for the ABA to have a position on it. Uh, it. Thank you, Stella. And and as a uh, on, on the one that we just looked at, there were a couple of things that that stayed on the cutting room floor. Um, there, there was a the initial draft of it. In addition to the seven points that were there, had a provision that the issue of equal pay should be subject to a study that that um, ought to be brought back to the legislature every two years. We dropped that one. Um, is it, a, is it a good idea? Maybe, but there reaches a point where you just gotta say, you know, there are some core things in here and if it's not, we're gonna leave it be. So in terms of the resolution, and please understand the nomenclature we use is the resolution and there's the report, two different things. So the resolution itself, on uh, the language, you know, address the, the important components, um the uh uh you know identify um so i, I this that let me kind of refocus in terms of this slide because we're moving to the to the report itself we've gone through the resolutions now so the report needs to address every component of the resolution so the first one that you saw that just referenced a section in the u.s code the the report is going to tease out what those protections for journalists were. In the long one that you saw that, um, that dealt with um, uh, equal pay, uh, uh, every one of those seven had to be part of the discussion. But you got to make sure that the report does not argue for things that are not in the resolution. And what happens sometimes is you'll come up with the resolution and report, we'll drop things out of the resolution, but the report will still argue for them. You can't do that. Third, um, these reports are, are pretty detailed. So, for example, the report on the equal pay resolution uh, will not simply say there is a disparity of pay on the basis of gender. It'll give statistics with regard to it. Um, 
it will it will identify reference to existing policy to let the house know that it is not simply repeating policy but it is not um it is not violating prior policy as as well and the report itself is not policy right only the resolution is policy uh, you see a reference here to a general information form and executive summary. I'll skip that for a second because the next slide is going to talk more about resolutions, about reports rather. All right. So in the report, again, there's a format and a style to the drafting guide that was on an earlier slide. Make sure that um, that you stay consistent with that. And then you've got data about the font and justification. Um, et cetera. So um, those are just some technical items that you should try to deal with that. Paula and Ali um, will, will be great about trying to correct and fix that, but you make life easier on everybody if, um, if we can, uh, you know, follow those, uh, those drafting uh, suggestions as well. Uh, next slide. All right. So there's going to be a deadline for the mid-year meeting in November. On a, you know, it's November 15th, give or take five days. And there will be a deadline for the annual meeting in mid-May. So one of the things that this means in terms of ultimate timing, the council will usually meet end of October, and the council will usually meet at the end of April. It's gonna be those meetings typically at our April meeting, we will usually give final approval to what we will file in May. And our October meeting, we will usually give final approval to what we, um, what we will be um, uh, uh, filing in uh, did I say October, in November, okay? You can't come to us at, the, at, at our council meeting at the annual meeting and say, present something to the house in two days. We can't do that. So when we talk about getting approval prior to going to the house, we have to get final approval by that spring meeting for the, for the annual and by that fall meeting for mid-year. What, what does that mean? It also means that if you want to get something over to us for final approval in April and you think it's going to require some work, et cetera, try to get it to us at the mid-year to get approval in principle, work out the bugs in it, talking to other committees if that's to be done. That can happen then in February and March, we can approve it in April, we can introduce it in May, we can bring it to the house in the summer. So that's kind of the way the timing works, all right? Um, can, I, can I jump in here about one other thing? Emergencies, if, if something happens in the world that is a fast-breaking emergency and it's happening in July, uh, there is a way to get a policy related to it before the house. Fast breaking news is, you know, is a uh, is one excuse that works. Uh, we can't do it directly, but we can probably get it done. So keep that in mind. If anything develops, that is that uh, it's very important for the ABA to speak on. Okay. Thank you, thank you. And and uh, and as Estelle points out, there's actually again two ways two ways to do that. It it might be after it might be December, and in December. Um, the 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 house democrats pass a bill saying we that the supreme court should be 15 members instead of nine um and they do this in december and we and somebody sits there and says um that's a great idea the aba needs to support it or it's a terrible idea the aba needs to oppose it um and probably there's going to be people who say both um that comes up in December, you try to bring it in as an emergency resolution, it will probably work. Um, you see a presidential tweet in December that you don't like, 
and you want um, to put in a resolution that says the president of the United States should never tweet again and say it's an emergency because look at this terrible tweet in December, rules and calendar probably would say, hey, you knew about presidential tweets for the past two years. This is not an emergency. Bring it in later. So that's one way it happens. Just so you'll know, state and local bars can bring resolutions in until the very last minute. The weekend before the House, a state and local bar could bring one in. Not politically smart to bring something in 48 hours in front of the House, but it could happen. So it's a great point, Estelle. Um, Co-sponsors, before you file the resolution, before we as a section file the resolution, we can obtain co-sponsors. Co-sponsors, you know, show these are people who are with us um, with on the ground floor. There's some pluses and minuses to go to co-sponsors. If you get a co-sponsor and we want to change the resolution, we can't do it without our co-sponsors assistance, with our co-sponsors agreement. But typically it's very good to have co-sponsors. Exceptions, but typically good. You can add supporters at any time. But after we file the report with rules and calendar, it's unlikely that they will that we will be able to get new co-sponsors under recent rules. So once we file it, rules and calendar will look at it. And different rules and calendar compositions are more or less activist about what they do with resolutions. Typically, what rules and calendar does is just suggestions, but they're suggestions that we take seriously. And four times out of five, we will try to accept their Res, their um, suggestions, right? Um, once we get those suggestions, we will have a very short period of time, a week, two weeks, four or five days. You don't know how much time they give us to give them a redraft. So if you are the moving force behind one of these resolutions, uh, you're the person who drafted that equal pay resolution. And um, rules and calendar says seven action items is too many. We're not going to calendar it with seven action items. Um, cut it down to three. Uh, we'll come back to you and we'll say, this is what rules and calendar wants. And you'll say, do we have to cut it to three? And we'll say, no, there's risk to not doing what they say. Maybe they won't calendar it. But hey, you know, if you think that seven is important, we'll go back to rules and calendar and we'll say seven is important. So we will try to come back to you for your feedback. Rules and calendar, um, you know, one rules and calendar a while back came to us and said, your, your report is too argumentative. We thought that was an odd comment. Um, what does that mean? Our report is too argumentative. It's an argument, of course. It's argumentative. Um, so we'll come back to you and we'll say, hey, they say it's more argumentative. Um, you know, why don't we, uh, why don't we, you know, take out these, these uh, five adjectives and send it back? Are you okay with it? How do you want to redraft it? Typically, we'll go back to you and we'll say, you want to give us a cut as to what you want it to look like? So very short fuse then. We may or may not be able to go to you and, and um, you know, really be able to get your feedback, but we will try to for a couple of reasons. Um, it's your product and um, we don't want to mess with your product. And maybe some of those adjectives that are in there are really important to you. Um, but ultimately, you should know the decision is going to be the council's. Once you give it to the council, it's really important to know it's the council's resolution then. It's not your resolution. We will go to you and, you know, seek your suggestions, et cetera. But, but ultimately, at that point, um, it's the council's product and we'll be making the determinations. But we are going to be looking to you um, as the author for it, right? Estelle, you look like you've got something really important to say. Not at all. All You're right, the rest of the next slide. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, uh, the resolutions 
It says they can be revised until the day the House meets. That's almost true, actually. And this was a slide that came out of Rules and Calendar. Um, Rules and Calendar meets the weekend before the House. So the House meets on a Monday and or Tuesday. Rules and Calendar will meet on that Saturday, Sunday. Um, if we have amendments to our own resolution, we bring it to Rules and Calendar uh, and it's best form to bring it to rules and calendar no matter what, because they will make sure the House has the resolutions. They will report to everybody else at, at the annual meeting that for the House as to what's happening. If an amendment is more than five words, it must go to rules and calendar on that weekend before. Must. We can add up to five words to a revision on the on the uh, House floor. The report itself cannot be changed until after the resolution passes. And typically, and Estelle gave a great example, uh, one of our resolutions that initially just dealt with reproductive health care issues was broadened to deal generally with health issues and our our resolution got ahead of the report. And it could have gone the other way, by the way. We could have cut half of a resolution, but the report still talks about both parts of it. Um, this past year, Estelle went to Rules and Calendar and, and basically said, here, I'm able to fix the, uh, the, the, report, the report. Not so easy. Um, so typically, the mode is that the report doesn't get changed before the House meets. If the resolution gets changed, we will have a week or two after the annual meeting to fix the report. Um, everybody says that the report is not policy, only the resolution is policy, but the report always um, hangs with the resolution. So. You know, it's kind of like legislative history. You don't resort to the legislative history, you resort to the legislation, but it is hanging around there. And the last thing on here, um, I know more fun facts than this, but um, but the earlier we submit our resolution, um, the lower number we we get. So, and it stems from the first resolution we put in. So if we get assigned initially, you know, we're 111, uh, our first resolution will be 111A, even if we put other things later, it'll stay 111B through X. But, um, uh, and you know, this year we were 115 out of, I think 123 was the was the ultimate number. So that So that's kind of how that goes towards drafting. Uh, we're, and the, we're the important thing about that, Mark, the important thing about that is that uh, it'll be handled by and large earlier in the agenda so that if people leave the middle of the day and this comes up in the afternoon, uh, you've got a problem. It, it makes it easier to have a critical mass in the room. It's true. Um, and for better or worse, this last session um, it was a Monday, Tuesday House. The Tuesday House convened at eight in the morning and we were first up so um our resolutions were held between 803 and 819 or something not prime <laughs> time but we had, didn't have much to do about it and all of our resolutions passed by the way sometimes it's good that it's that that we're bringing it to an empty house sometimes it's bad it depends politically no way to figure it out uh uh next slide please All right, so this is what a resolution part looks like, right? Uh, it'll just start with a resolved clause. If there are further resolved, we'll have further resolved clauses. It'll look just like that, numbered lines, numbered paragraphs, um, aerial 12 point type. So if you get, you know, if you get nothing else out of this seminar that Estelle and I uh, are giving and then Paul Alley put together, the font should be Arial 12. So, fun fact. Uh, I never, I never knew that. I never knew that. There, that's why it's a fun fact, Estelle. You know. <laughs> uh, let's move to the next slide. Um, 
The report, on the other hand, uh, this looks this looks like my uh, pleading template where you know I've got my caption and my respectfully submitted is all that you see over here. But um, the resolution will be thrown in there, one inch margin on all sides, a 12 point aerial for the uh, for the headings and the text, 10 point for footnotes, um, single space but double space between paragraphs. All right. Uh, next slide. Um, so it's going to end with the uh, you know our resolutions will end with our with the name of our chair, um, the identifying chair is the section and the month and date of the resolution and forevermore you know if we've got resolution 115B uh, that that passed in August 2019 uh, it'll be called uh, you know 2019. A for 2019 annual 119B. All right, so that's what the template of that will be looking like. Next, please. All right, so the end of the resolution is going to have these two forms, um, which are often, you know, really duplicative. The summary of the resolutions is is going to be um, oftentimes um, a repeat of the operative text of the resolution. If it's a small resolution, um, that's what it's going to say. And, and if you look, the general information form and the um, summary of the resolu uh, uh, and the executive summary have the identical point one. So those are just going to be duplicates. Those will be exactly the same. On the GIF, approval by submitting entity. So that will be say something like approved by a Civil Rights Social Justice um, Council, um, April 25th, 2018. Has this or a similar uh, resolution been submitted to, that, to the um, House or board previously? So, you know, again, um, uh, if I were dealing with the resolution that had the seven points on the Fair Pay Act, uh, we would probably put in there the House um, has adopted multiple policies urging um, equality of pay on the basis of gender, colon, and that's when um, one would list uh, uh, the, the, those resolutions. Uh, uh, what other association policies in, um, uh, uh, would be affected? Um, typically, none of these would be, would be um, you know, totally opposed to the to the resolution and this is where if 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 this is duplicative of existing policy in this number 4 we'd have a problem people would sit there and say why are you putting it forward um is is this a late report that identifies the urgency issue that is still identified status of legislation if applicable um you know this is important to let the house know whether there's a piece of legislation right out there that's that that's important to uh, to uh, deal with, um, and then you know seven is uh, uh, what our plan is for implementation. Usually, one would put in to enable the ABA to um, draft amicus briefs to enable the ABA to uh, to lobby with with. Um, with the National Uniform Law Commission to enable the ABA to go to state legislatures. Um, cost to the association, both direct and indirect costs. Um, if we want it to get passed, uh, you know, uh, uh, typically one would be, well, typically one would be identifying um, no, du no direct costs and, you know, minimal indirect costs. But, you know, um, maybe, Maybe there would be a, 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 a resolution, and here's an idea for a resolution that says that, that at every session of the House of Delegates, there should be an assigned, uh, assigned um, uh, uh, accessibility for disabilities section, um, which interestingly enough, we don't have. Um, we might have uh, and, and cost to the association. You know, maybe it would cost some money for the ABA to do that. Maybe we would say at every session of the House of Delegates, there should be a signer for the deaf. Um, uh, 
cost to the association, probably some cost to the association. So that would have to be have have to be down there. And if there's something else at the bottom of that slide, I can't see it. And you'll talk to us about it at that point. In terms of the executive summary, um, you know, the summary is at the beginning, as we've identified. The issue that this addresses, you might say, um, uh, um, uh, despite numerous uh, 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 horatory statements in favor of, of equal pay, the pay gap uh, persists. Uh, this resolution provides concrete examples as to how to address the persistent pay gap. Uh, explain how the proposed policy will address the issue. Uh, the proposed policy creates greater transparency in pay and uh, requires employers to be more specific about explaining and justifying uh, disparities in pay on the basis of gender and race. You might say something like that. A summary of minority views or opposition, internal or external. If you know of it, you gotta, you gotta say it. As often as not, it says there is no opposition known. So that's what these two forms look like. Please make sure that they're filled out. Um, nobody likes filling these out. It's 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 um, you know kind of like the civil cover sheet on a complaint that you file. Uh, uh, you know what a what a pain in the butt. But the court won't accept it without it. So you've got to make it and put it in. Next slide, please. All right. So conclusion. You have an idea. Work with your committee. Get feedback and approval. Coordinate with other. Uh, committees. Before you go outside the council, get approval from the council at least in principle. Once approved, and you know, uh, we put those three asterisks there to make sure that you don't go outside of our section and you don't go outside of the of the ABA um, until un, until it's approved by the council, and Estelle or I say yeah, it's ready for prime time, put it out. Make sure you get approval from the council at, at when we say at the section meeting prior to the house, we are not talking about the meeting two days prior to the house. We're talking about the meeting, which is three weeks before the submission date. Please remember the November and May deadlines, which means you need our approval at our October or May meetings. Then after it's out, um, and we didn't mention this, but at some point before the House meets, Estelle and I really appreciate it if, if you folks give us talking points. By the way, typically committee chairs are not at the House. And typically committee chairs who come in on Thursday or Friday and Saturday to meet don't hang around till Tuesday to be at the house. If you are going to be at the house, let us know. Under some circumstances, we can get you folks speaking privileges. Um, but typically that's not. So give us talking points and then we present over to the house. Last slide. All right. Um, so what happens after passage? And um, it's going to be really important in a large part to get Estelle's perspective about this, because in addition to everything else, um, Estelle, when she was a beltway dweller before um, she moved <laughs> to the country, um, was, the, was the chair of the Government uh, Affairs Committee within the, the ABA. Um, after things pass the House, uh, we try not to let them die. And when you look at the House um, uh, website, there are some videos of what happens uh, about this. Our resolutions about the Violence Against Women Act, there's a, a video that shows that, that helped towards passage. Um, many of our other um, items uh, really had, had significant uh, uh, legislative effect. So it's used in the media, it's used in governmental um, advocacy, it's used in amicus brief, um, it's 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 uh, used in multiple ways. It doesn't happen overnight, but ABA policy 
you know, does have significance. Um, and uh, Estelle, before putting it to, the, to questions, uh, why don't you wrap us up? Well, let me uh, elucidate a little bit this slide. I think one of the things, as I said in the beginning, is to uh, you have to have somewhat lowered expectations about what is going to happen to it. As Mark said, we try not to let it die. But the fact is the ABA rarely lobbies in state legislatures, deferring to state bars for that. Um, there's nothing that would prevent us or, or you from going to your state bar and saying the ABA just passed this and we think the state bar should lobby on it. Do we need to get something passed by the state bar? But if not, the state legislature is taking up this issue. Please uh, get this, the uh, public affairs director of the bar to do something about it. Um, and as I say, I think in general, the amicus brief process, although it's not easy, has more of an across the board effect in terms of, of visibility of the issue uh, than a lot of the legislative work. Uh, and I think that other than that, uh, I would wrap up by saying that this process is not as ridiculous as it sounds. Um, it all sort of makes sense once you start doing it. We've got a couple of questions that I think that, you know, it would be a good thing to wrap up with. One is, um, the last one that just came in was, uh, are there explanatory templates available for reports and resolutions? And I think that um, uh, Paula and Allie are going to send you some examples of reports and the forms that go with them to show you how, you know, how they're typically uh, composed. And uh, as Mark said, a lot of it is duplicative and somewhat silly, um, you know, summary of the resolution. And then on the next page, there's another summary of the resolution. Um, we don't know why they ask for these things twice, but they do. Um, so that's that's one thing that we can knock out right now. And then the other thing is, how do we how do, how do we find existing policy? Oh, somebody answered that. It, you search the green book, and if you have, if there's any ambiguity, you should ask us and and or the section director. But your first step is to search the policies that are summarized in the green book of the ABA, which we've discussed that you have a link to in Wendy's memo. Um, it is indexed poorly, in my view, so we won't always find something immediately. And if, if you can't find it and you have reason to believe there is one or a related one, um, as I said, use, use us as resources because I think chances are we're old enough that we remember when it was passed, if there was one. Um, let me see what else. Mark, you want to take so the while other you're, while you're reading other questions, let me answer let me answer a couple. There was there's one suggestion here, which I think is a great suggestion. Um, and that is uh uh and I and and you know I I I don't know exactly how to do it, but I'm gonna put this suggestion over over to staff. Um it would be a great idea if if there were kind of a clearinghouse of resolutions in process. So that um, one committee knows that another committee is looking at something as a matter of um, of process, and um, uh, I'm going to turn that that um, suggestion over to Ali and um, and Paula to see if uh, if if there's a way, you know, perhaps during um, during the the uh, committee process that that be shared it would be it would be great if our uh, special counsel were were able to do that and so let me put that suggestion out and um and as as uh you know still i don't know if you've queued to answer another question but one notion out there everything we said about uh committee chairs etc um keeping things in-house until they're ready for prime time uh, applies to everybody. It applies to the council members, it applies to the officers, it applies to me and Estelle. Um, so uh, uh, that's not just for, for committee members, it's it's all of us should be cautious and and, and careful about that for a whole lot of reasons. Um, you know, sometimes we might have an idea and if we mention it, uh, uh, it, it, you know, we have we might have a particularly good idea. Somebody else might get their hands on the idea and come up with a really bad version of it. And then we're chasing that one instead of promoting our own. So um, I think that that's an important feature. 
Um, one, other, one other thing it's important for you to know is at our council meetings, we also take up requests for co-sponsorship of resolutions. And if it's early enough, in other words, if it's not the council meeting three days before the House of Delegates meets, um, we can, if we decide to co-sponsor, be listed on the actual resolution as a co-sponsor, but we also are invited thereby to make suggestions and give possible edits. So that becomes a, you know, a great collaborative process because we can make improvements to, to the resolution. If, for example, the health law people had gotten in touch with me at an earlier point, uh, about broadening that reproductive clinic resolution, we could have had them on the on the papers, and the uh, report would have been done um, and relating to the what turned out to be the full resolution. So that's always something to to notice too. And if you get wind, even though they they shouldn't share with you early either, but if you get wind of something being done, for example, or being worked on by the health law section that you think we have an interest in, it's always a good idea to sort of present that or, or, or drop that p rumor. And, you know, we can then call them and say, we hear you're working on such and such. Can we work together? So I think, um, I think that we have um, uh, dealt with um, everything that's there. There was, there was one question that we dealt with earlier, you know, how do you find, um, existing ABA policy? And the short answer is with difficulty. Um, but it, it is in the green book and we've given you the links to the, to the green book. Um, the problem is that the green book is inconsistently indexed is the way I will, I will put it. Sometimes you find exactly what you're looking for. Uh, sometimes you just don't. And if, uh, and again, it's one of the reasons why, if you bring it to your special counsel, special counsel can bring it to me and Estelle, and we don't have perfect memory, but um, we do have, I think we've got a pretty good feel for most of the resolutions that, that have been developed as policy. But the answer is look at the green book, and if you need assistance again, um, uh, Ali, Paula, um, Estelle, and I are, are ready to assist any way we can. And let me let me give one example though of of poor indexing. The in in the voting rights area, there is, as you know, a, in many many states, a bar on former felons voting, sometimes forever. Uh, that is not listed under voting rights in the Green Book. It's listed under criminal justice collateral consequences of of criminal convictions. So even though it is a central issue in the voting area, that's not where you'll find it. Now, this is something I happen to know, but, you know, there are probably other things I happen to know and Mark happens to know. So you can always check in with us and, and sometimes at least we'll, we'll have the keys to the kingdom. The other things, I don't know why you're so much bigger than I am, Estelle. That's kind of what I'm trying to do. I'm sitting very close to my computer because I'm oh. so tall, Mark. Listen, I'm only, I'm, I'm only 211, so it's okay. Um, <laughs> I think uh, I think I don't that see any more questions, and I think that we've gone through the hour. Over. So um, thank you, everybody. Are we, are we over? So thank you, everybody. And uh, anything else you need to know, please, please let us know. Do we have a disembodied voice now telling us uh, that we're gonna that we've reached the uh, the end of end of our discussion? Um, or